folks on the Zoom, are we ready to start? Should I begin? Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Buenas noches a todos, todas y todes. Bienvenidos. Uh, welcome to everyone who's joining us here in New York. We're a very small and intimate group. Um, also, welcome to everyone who's joining in LA and from elsewhere, including Chile. Bienvenidos a toda la gente que está aquí en Nueva York, también la gente que está en Los Ángeles y también la gente que está conectando en línea desde distintos lugares, incluso desde Chile. My name is Heather Gies. I'm managing editor at NACLA. Mi nombre es Heather Gies. Soy editora encargada de NACLA. Uh, for those who may not know, NACLA is a nonprofit publication that produces information and analysis on Latin America and the Caribbean from a progressive perspective. And we've been doing that for more than 50 years. Uh, NACLA es un medio sin fines de lucro que publica noticias y análisis sobre América Latina y el Caribe desde una perspectiva uh, progresista desde hace más de 50 años. And this is a bilingual event. Este es un evento bilingüe. Entonces, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Patricio so he will explain how the interpretation will work. Le doy la palabra a Patricio para que nos cuente cómo funciona la interpretación. Muchas gracias, Heather. Thank you very much, Heather. En un momento más, van a encender la interpretación y van a poder encontrar un botón abajo a la derecha donde dice interpretación y pinchan interpretación y español para escuchar la interpretación al español. And in just a few more minutes, we will activate the interpretation. And there you could find at the bottom right corner of the Zoom app a button that says interpretation. And there you just activate the interpretation in English. If you cannot see this button, there will be a button with three dots and you press that interpretation and then English. Si no ven el botón que dice interpretación, presionen el botón de tres puntos y después interpretación y ponen español. Thank you, Heather. Gracias, Heather. Okay, so here in New York, we're going to be um, projecting in English. Um, so at, at NACLA, we've been working on putting together a issue of our quarterly print magazine focused on ties of solidarity between Latin America and the Caribbean and Palestine. Uh, so of course, as part of that, we've been thinking a lot about shared histories of settler colonialism in both these places and around the world. Um, and so in that spirit of of thinking about um, you know, ongoing, extremely violent forms of settler colonialism. I just want to acknowledge that here in Brooklyn, our event is taking place on the land of the Lenape. And so for all of our folks who are joining us from other places, I would invite you to uh, just take a moment and think about who historically has inhabited the, the places where your event is being held and uh, where you live and work and play. Um, so, this uh, this event will um, include uh, presentations by a number of folks. They will be introduced shortly, but just to give a sense of the um, run of show, we are going to have a first round where um, all of our speakers will speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, then we'll have a wonderful musical interlude uh, from, from a performer joining us from Valparaiso, Chile. Then we'll have a second round where folks can respond to one another from that first round of, of uh, conversation. And then we will take questions from the audience. Uh, so to start with, we are going to hear from our moderator. Um, we were initially to have two moderators. Unfortunately, Gianpaolo Baiocchi is sick and will not be able to join us, uh, but we'll be in good hands with Romina. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Romina. Romina Green Rioja is assistant professor in Latin American history at Washington and Lee University. She's a scholar of gender and race of modern Chile and Argentina. Her book manuscript to govern is to educate modeling racial education in modern Chile, explores the relationship between state education, immigration policies and settler colonialism, demonstrating how those institutions and policies contributed to structural racism and the social marginalization of the indigenous Mapuche. She also researches and writes about the feminist movement in Chile and Argentina. 
And this is not in my notes, but I will add that she is also an editorial committee member at NACLA and just co-guest edited a fabulous um, issue of our magazine focused on plurinationalism from below in the Andes and beyond. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Romina, who will introduce things, um, and Yvonne Louis of the uh, Solidarity Research Center will also provide a bit of an introduction. Thank you, Heather, uh, for, uh, for the introduction, and uh, welcome everybody who's here, and thank you for participating in this very important discussion. I kind of wanted to begin by uh, talking a little bit um, about uh, also who Daniel Hadwe is um, and a little bit about uh, also why he's also relevant in Chilean politics, because I think for those who are from the outside may just see this as a particular campaign for you know solidarity with somebody, but I think there's he is, has have led an important imprint on Chilean politics, not just in Chile, but for also those of us like myself who is Chilean but lives abroad. Um, the first I I have a well I've known about Kadwe for many years, but I think about this one story that really had an impact when uh, around 2016. I was headed uh, from my uh, family apartment in Barrio Franklin to a uh, an event at the National Stadium related to September 11th, but it was not the day of September 11th. It was uh, some weeks before, but it was an event. I got a taxi and that taxi ride, the taxi driver was listening to something and he, he said, do you know who I'm listening to? And I said, well, no, I don't know. I just got in your taxi. And he said, well, I'm listening to a speech uh, by my mayor, it's Daniel Jadwe. And I said, oh, really? And he's like, do you know who he is? And I said, yeah, I know. And then he went on to tell me about how inspired he has been by him, about the popular pharmacies and about many programs and he feel, how he felt impacted by his uh, at the time he had only been mayor of uh, Recoleta for maybe about four years, and uh, and I just remember that story really well because he was just so excited to tell me about him, and I think that was sort of the energy that you could do feel from a lot of people who've been impacted by his policies and those around him. Um, I also think it's important to mention about uh, a little bit about the community and the political kind of background of Jadwe. Jadwe comes is from uh, Palestinian descent uh, community in Chile, which if those who don't know, the Palestinian descent community in Chile is the largest outside of the Middle East. Uh, and uh, it was uh, has a long history of beginning of immigration from the 19th century and also arrived at different waves. So there are people who came more recently, but some people can date their family to arrival in Chile to the 19th century. Uh, that I think Hadwe's story is also one that rep, that is also very connected to um, some of the complicated histories that the community has faced over the years, um, especially in relation to politics. Uh, there has been always a sort of um, a, a kind of uh, understanding that a good portion of the Palestinian community has been more right leaning. And Hadwe, along with many others, I have many friends who are Chilean Palestinian who are left leaning, have found themselves as sometimes at odds with family members, but came to politics because of radicalization that they experienced. Hadwe himself had radicalized during the Pinochet dictatorship, which I think was also an important period of time uh, when uh, many others uh, who were Palestinian descent radicalized. It was a moment of also that coincided with the first intifada. We do see uh, that around 1983, there was a sizable, an important student-led rally in Chile that was in solidarity with Palestine, but also became a protest against the dictatorship. And this sort of reflects the radicalization of sectors of, of the those who are Palestinian descent in Chile experience um, and has experienced since then because politics of Palestine has also been very much tied to their own identity in Chile. So how do you talk about settler colonialism? How do you talk about uh, state repression and state violence? and not also recognize the history of the dictatorship and re recognize what Israel is doing to Palestine and Palestinians. Um, 
uh, uh, Daniel Halloway also through this experience of radicalization uh, came to join the uh, Communist Party of Chile in 1993, which is a very old party. I myself have family members who uh, were, uh, were members of the Communist Party in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And so there's those who I think it's important to know that it has a long trajectory and ties with the working class and continues to have a very sizable impact is, uh, I think last year or earlier this year it came out that the Communist Party of Chile is one of uh, still is currently like the largest in membership in Chile. So it gives a sense in terms of the scope and has a very also working class base uh, as well. Holloway has been, uh, he was mayor of Recoleta uh, from 2012 to 2024. And um, during his time as mayor, he has done several things. One thing that I do want to mention is that he has uh, also hosted NACVA events in Recoleta. Uh, it's become, uh, it's also, there's a kind of, is it important to have like a mayor that allows a place of, for people to organize politically to recognize Palestine, which uh, not just in street protests or student protests, but also related to um, the city of Recoleta. He's also, I think the most popular of his initiatives were the popular pharmacies, uh, which uh, is what tends to be most known uh, as well, which uh, hopefully we'll hear more about in terms of that impact. Lastly, he also ran for president in 2021, uh, and I also want to mention this because uh, during the election, it came out that in, ter in terms of the results, he was the most popular for those of us, for those Chileans who live outside of, uh, of Chile. Uh, I myself and many of us vote ended up voting for him during the first round. And uh, we're very disappointed when he uh, when he lost. But it gives a sense of like the scope of his impact, and had we we voted for him because we had been following what he had been doing as well in uh, in Recoleta, and also being very outspoken in solidarity with Palestine always. Um, so now I want to pass on the baton to you, Ivan. Thank you, Bromina. Uh, so I'm Yvonne here in Los Angeles with my comrades um, at Eastside Cafe, which is a Zapatista community center in the neighborhood of El Sereno in Los Angeles in Tongva land. Um, I just want to add to Romina's excellent introduction that our goals are threefold here tonight or this morning, depending on which time zone you're in. So our goals are firstly to learn from the radical municipalist reforms um, in Chile, which is special because it was unfortunately the birthplace of neoliberalism. Um, and there's a beautiful quote from Daniel Hadway that is also where neoliberalism should come to be buried as well. So I think it's really fantastic that um, these municipalist reforms really flourished um, in a very difficult uh, context. Secondly, that we understand the broader geopolitical machinations around the concerted right-wing attack on Daniel Hadway um, and the role of transnational corporations. So we're really fortunate to have David Legg here from the People's Health Movement, who will talk a little bit about the role of big pharmaceutical companies. Um, and then last, this is really an experiment. So we're convened here in part to see if we can actually rally together, we're all part of a global municipalist movement. Can we rally together to free Hadway, uh, but also to free ourselves in the process? So with that, um, I will uh, pass it back to Romina to introduce our um, incredible panelists and our performer. Yes, so I'm going to uh, introduce our, our panelists and our performer, uh, not necessarily in the order that they're gonna speak, um, but uh, to give a sense of who they are. The first speaker is Farah Khadwe, uh, who was former director of community development Recoleta. He was elected as council person in Recoleta commune in 2021. Uh, he assumed the position of mayor when uh, Daniel Khadwe was incarcerated. 
He worked for eight years as a director of community development in Recoleta, where he participated in developing the Farmacias Populares, or popular pharmacies, and other projects, including the People's Bookstore, but I think it also might be connected to Biblioteca Pública Pedro de Medel. The other speaker is uh, Rodrigo Hurtado from Universidad Abierta de Recoleta. Uh, Rodrigo Hurtado is an executive director at the Universidad Abierta, established by Daniel Jadwe in 2018. Hurtado has over 20 years of experience in education. He worked at the Technological Innovation Program of the Ministry of Economy, and then at the Continuing Education Program at the University of Chile's Philosophy Department, where he worked for 10 years in distance learning programs. Before arriving at the Universidad Abierta de Recoleta, he was part of the Bicentennial Project at the Juan Gomez Mias campus. And lastly, we have also Daniel David Lege, Le Legge, uh, at the People's Health Movement. Uh, David originally trained as a physician, but has worked in many health services and public health uh, since uh, the early 1980s. Uh, since 1994, David has been active in the International People's Health Council, uh, where he was also uh, one of the eight founding organizations of the People's Health Movement in December 20, 2000. Sorry, in December 2000. He has been active in the People's Health Movement since the first People's Health Assembly in Savar that same year, including participating in the, I don't know the acronym, but IPHU uh, courses, uh, WHO Watch uh, and Global Health Watch and the Trade and Health Circle and the Advisory Council. And uh, we're going to be joined after we're going to have a, after the speaker speak, we're going to have a performance by uh, Carmen Lienkeo uh, as Andean singer with a magnetic voice, a, uh, a simple and profound lyrical work capable of transporting listeners to diverse landscapes of Latin America. She has worked for over uh, 20 years in groups uh, with folkloric roots. Her music is a natural response to the rhythmic patterns of the traditions of her territory, as well as poetry and language of South America. In this uh, same way, she traveled sharing her music through the continent. Carmen creates a new repertoire with lyrical uh, lyrics impregnated with intimacy, reflecting a very per, uh, personal perspective. So they echo and reflect the daily reality where she, where it lives, where she lives. Her first album, Canto para Siempre, is a manifesto inspired by a mixture of mestizo, mapuche, North Andean, and South American cultures from the present to the future. Um, all right. So uh, I, I think our first speaker is going to be um, Rodrigo Hurtado. Buenas noches a todas, a todos. En primer lugar, deseo saludar la realización de este encuentro que se diseña eh, y se pone en línea para destacar eh, la obra encabezada por Daniel Jadwe en la comuna de Recoleta y también servir de denuncia a la situación de persecución que viene viviendo desde hace ya más de un año, eh, para solo referirme a eh, la última causa eh, que él ha tenido que enfrentar. Eh, quiero también agradecer la posibilidad de referirme al proyecto de la Universidad Abierta, un proyecto inspirado en la visión de Daniel, eh, quien de alguna manera, eh, según sus propias palabras, eh, ha procurado a lo largo de 12 años al frente del municipio de, de Recoleta eh, actualizar el ideario y la visión que tuvo Luis Emilio Recabarren, padre del movimiento obrero chileno y fundador del Partido Comunista de Chile, quien visualizaba la eh, actividad al frente de los gobiernos locales como la gran oportunidad que tenía un partido popular revolucionaria como el Partido Comunista para abaratar, simplificar y mejorar la vida de todos los vecinos y vecinas. 
Eh, en esa inspiración, Daniel Jaue comienza a desplegar un proyecto contra hegemónico antineoliberal que procura, podríamos decir, eh, entregar oportunidades de una mejor vida en cuestiones fundamentales para el desarrollo de las personas en el ámbito de la salud, la educación, etc., al margen de las soluciones del mercado, en un país, como bien se señaló en la introducción, donde por desgracia... Eh, surge o tiene su primera expresión histórica concreta eh, la ideología del neoliberalismo. En ese marco se crea en un primer momento la farmacia popular. Eh, hay que decir que la farmacia ha repartido varios millones de medicamentos y que tiene alrededor de 40.000 eh, personas inscritas en una comuna que cuenta en total con 200.000 habitantes. Otro tanto sucede con la óptica popular, el centro audiológico, luego vino la inmobiliaria popular que, está, que construyó el conjunto eh, habitacional llamado Justicia Social 1 y que va a dar lugar prontamente a varias otras eh, construcciones destinadas a ofrecer eh, arriendo a precio justo en un país que no escapa a la crisis del costo de los arriendos, eh, como podemos ver en distintas eh, ciudades y países del mundo. Y enseguida vino la Universidad Abierta Recoleta, que en ese programa eh, contestatario que buscaba establecer, buscaba y busca establecer alternativas al mercado, no podía faltar un proyecto como la Universidad Abierta Recoleta, por cuanto Chile, producto precisamente de esas reformas neoliberales, por desgracia ostenta una educación eh, básica y secundaria que en un 70% está en manos de privados y que el panorama es aún peor a nivel de la educación superior con un aproximadamente 80% de la matrícula en instituciones privadas, muchas de las cuales no existían antes de fines del siglo pasado. En ese contexto se lanza el proyecto de la Universidad Abierta a fines del año 2018. Y ese es un dato no menor porque es un proyecto que ha estado de alguna manera condicionado, pero sentimos nosotros sinceramente que también respaldado por varios fenómenos eh, consecutivos que eh, han sido, desde una primera mirada, adversos o complejos, pero que han venido a demostrar a nuestro entender el valor de la visión que animó a Daniel al impulsar la creación de la universidad. Me refiero, desde luego, al estallido social, al llamado estallido social, la rebelión popular que conocimos a partir del 18 de octubre, del año 2019, es decir, apenas un año de crear la universidad. Eh, sin ir más lejos, el día de ayer se cumplieron precisamente los primeros cinco años de ese eh, evento que, eh, por desgracia, no condujo a las transformaciones que se requerían eh, producto de las eh, grandes carencias que estaban a la base de ese estallido eh, y que no han sufrido corrección en estos cinco años. Enseguida vino la pandemia, eh, un hecho único en la historia de la humanidad eh, y que sin embargo para la Universidad Abierta Recoleta significó una gran oportunidad por cuanto los formatos digitales permitieron que el esfuerzo democratizador del conocimiento, que es el gran norte que guía nuestro proyecto, llegara mucho más allá de los límites de nuestra comuna y es así como la universidad abierta eh, cuenta con alrededor de 150.000 estudiantes inscritos en todos sus programas formativos a lo largo de estos seis años, de todas las comunas del país, en Chile existen 350 comunas e igual número de municipios, por supuesto, y de alrededor de 60 países, principalmente de América Latina. Eh, eso es muy, muy, muy alentador porque se trata de un espaldarazo al, a la inspiración y sobre todo a la necesidad que encontró eco en todas estas personas a lo largo de todo el continente y más allá respecto a los temas y los enfoques con que abordamos una diversidad de contenidos de eh, campos disciplinarios que en, en mayor o menor medida no pueden estar ausentes en todos aquellos que aspiran a transformar eh, la realidad social. 
Eh, la Universidad Abierta Recoleta en ese sentido, por supuesto que se reconoce como parte de la tradición eh, mundial, internacional de las eh, universidades populares eh, y con ellas, por lo demás, con muchas de ellas y de manera creciente hemos estado estableciendo redes de trabajo eh, a fin de potenciar nuestras capacidades, coordinar nuestras acciones para entregar herramientas formativas y conocimiento eh, a todos los luchadores eh, del continente y más allá. Y cuando digo conocimiento, tengo que referirme a la, al ámbito de la investigación, eh, que es muy fecundo en la Universidad Abierta Recoleta, y con una concepción del conocimiento eh, que también está está a contrapelo de su mercantilización en la mayoría de las universidades facultativas. Me refiero a que el objetivo básico de nuestra dirección de investigación es alinear el, la investigación con las necesidades eh, más sentidas de la población, con sus problemas más demandante, más acuciante, y es así como esta dirección ha desarrollado más de 80 investigaciones incluidas las evaluaciones de varias de las iniciativas populares eh, que confieren su eh, particular y potente característica a la gestión de Daniel Jaue, y eh, todas ellas a cargo de connotados expertos y académicos de los mejores centros eh, de investigación del país, de manera de que sus eh, hallazgos sus informes eh, en ningún momento han podido ser eh, cuestionados en términos de su eh, valor académico. Entonces, eh, a su vez, también la Universidad Abierta Recoleta despliega un área muy importante para, en el ámbito de la extensión. Y para nosotros, la extensión, pudiésemos decir, que es la continuación de la docencia por otros medios. Eh, quiero decir con esto que toda la amplia gama de actividades que procuran acercar el arte, la cultura, el conocimiento a la comunidad recoletana, eh, tiene en su diseño una componente educativa para dejar instaladas eh, saberes, nociones, conceptos, ideas en quienes asisten a estas actividades. En este momento nosotros eh, en Chile nos encontramos a puertas de una elección municipal. Eh, no tenemos ninguna duda que eh, el candidato de continuidad del proyecto liderado por Daniel Jaue se alzará con la victoria. Y en ese marco, naturalmente, esperamos profundizar eh, la, el proyecto iniciado por Daniel y la Universidad Abierta de Recoleta naturalmente estará al servicio de ese objetivo. Eso, compañeros, creo que es eh, una, una visión panorámica eh, del quehacer de la Universidad Abierta de Recoleta, y naturalmente quedo a disposición para aclarar cualquier duda en la ronda de consultas que está prevista más adelante en este conversatorio. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, it was very helpful to, uh, especially for everyone who hasn't learned about uh, the process of the universities and impact and everything. And now uh, we have a surprise guest, uh, which makes sense since this is an event exactly uh, about, uh, <laughs> about uh, his campaign. Uh, Daniel Jalo is here to join us and to speak. So, te damos el micrófono. Muy bien, muy buenas tardes, buenas noches aquí ya eh, a todos y a todas. Primero, muchas gracias por eh, esta invitación y por estar desarrollando este evento. Le envío un saludo a todas y todos los participantes eh, eh, y eh, solo quería entregarles un saludo. No quiero ser yo quien me refiera al caso directamente, eh, pero sí puedo decir que eh, esto no se puede entender solo eh, como un tema aislado de 
en el caso de Chile y mucho menos eh, en el caso de mi persona. Eh, la guerra jurídica que se está desarrollando eh, a lo largo de todo el mundo contra cualquier liderazgo que se salga del modelo neoliberal, que lo quiera enfrentar y que quiera eh, desmercantilizar la vida, eh, es hoy día resistida eh, con todas las armas posibles, ¿no? Y hoy día eh, el imperio está dispuesto a cometer genocidio, el imperio está dispuesto a desarrollar guerra, está dispuesto a derrocar gobiernos, eh, está dispuesto a intervenir naciones eh, desde todo ámbito de vista y cuando ninguna de estas herramientas eh, es posible, digamos, eh, eh, se preocupan de hacer esta guerra judicial que no conoce límite. Eh, yo solo quiero destacar un par de cosas eh, que pueden llamarle mucho la atención. Eh, yo jamás me hubiera imaginado que en una formalización de un caso como el nuestro, eh, una fiscal, una fiscal, la que lleva la investigación de la causa eh, y la que tiene por obligación eh, asumir el principio de objetividad, ¿no? que eh, obliga a investigar con igual celo todo lo que funda su teoría del caso como lo que desacredita su teoría del caso, sea capaz de decir que el problema de los hechos que se investigan es que detrás de ellos hay una ideología que pretendía intervenir el mercado. Y que dos párrafos después diga el problema es que aquí hay alguien que piensa que los problemas de la gente los debe resolver el Estado. Ese es el problema para la fiscal que lleva el caso. Eh, y por lo tanto, desde mi perspectiva, rompe completamente el principio de objetividad eh, porque lo que ella persigue son las ideas que no le gustan. ¿no? Hay antecedentes que efectivamente pueden hacer que esto sea mucho más grave. Eh, el hecho de eh, haber prevaricado en un viaje que yo tenía a Venezuela y haber amenazado a mi abogado eh, de manera absolutamente ilegal, sin tener ni siquiera cautelares, de que si yo me subía al avión, me iban a sacar del avión eh, con carabinero. Muestra que aquí hay un odio ideológico claro por parte de la fiscal, y en cualquier parte del mundo esto efectivamente eh, daría pie a una inhabilidad que debiera provenir de ella, no, no, no una discusión. Pero acá, eh, en el sistema que hemos visto en estos días en Chile, que está en una franca crisis porque ha sido cooptado por la derecha económica y por la derecha política, tanto la fiscalía como parte fundamental de, de los tribunales de justicia, eh, es muy difícil esperar eh, que se haga justicia y que la justicia actúe eh, de la manera adecuada. Dentro de lo que planteaba Rodrigo, a quien le envío un saludo muy afectuoso, no puedo comunicarme eh, con nadie de Recoleta directamente, pero ya que compartimos un panel en un seminario, lo, puedo, lo podré saludar. Eh, es importante saber que, por ejemplo, en esta lucha contra la corrupción que hemos dado en la comuna de Recoleta, nos ha tocado enfrentar a una universidad que es un reducto de la derecha chilena, que está ubicada en la comuna de Recoleta, ¿no? eh, y que fue construida con permisos que forman parte del caso de corrupción inmobiliaria más grande de la historia de Chile que ese juicio lleva casi 10 años y que extrañamente todos los, eh, varios de los que forman parte de la fiscalía de nuestro país, varios de los que actúan en el caso, ¿no? forman parte de la plana de, ese, eh, de esa universidad que está en conflicto con nosotros hace muchos años. ¿no? Eh, ¿Para qué decirles que si el fiscal regional que lleva la causa fue decano de la Facultad de Derecho de la Universidad de Chile. Hace poco se tuvo que inhabilitar porque era parte de los que tenían que investigar una causa de financiamiento ilegal de la política de una profesora de esa universidad a la cual se le pagaba 17 mil dólares por media jornada, el sueldo más alto de un profesor en el mundo. ¿no? Sin embargo, él no se ha inhabilitado para ver una causa con la cual su universidad tuvo conflicto durante 10 años y lo mantiene abierto hasta el día de hoy. Pero no solo él, el fiscal nacional, ¿no? varios familiares de varios de los jueces que han actuado en la causa, y para qué decirlo, todos los que se querellan forman parte del núcleo duro de la extrema derecha chilena, forman parte de una oficina de un nido de corrupción institucional descubierto 
lo sabíamos desde siempre, pero descubierto explícitamente hace un par de semanas, eh, y eso hace que eh, este caso de verdad eh, se presente casi eh, como un mal chiste, ¿no? Eh, además uno logra ver cómo el aparato del Estado como instrumento de dominación tiene distintas reglas para medir los casos. ¿eh? Cuando el Estado pierde plata porque se pierden medicamentos en el Ministerio de Salud, nadie alega. Pero si en tiempo de pandemia una asociación de municipios pierde plata eh, tomando decisiones para salvar vidas de la gente, es fraude al fisco. ¿No? Yo solo quiero dejar en claro que no hay ninguna acusación eh, en mi contra que tenga que ver ni con enriquecimiento ilícito, ni con nada que sea enriquecimiento personal. No, ni siquiera la fiscalía acusa aquello. Eh, aquí hay un problema efectivamente que es mucho más profundo y que es, son dos modelos eh, de sociedad distintos eh, y las cosas que hicimos en Recoleta sin duda plantearon una posibilidad alternativa al neoliberalismo, plantearon la posibilidad eh, de aplicar la teoría del decrecimiento eh, que hoy día se debería estar discutiendo en todo el mundo a través de la desmercantilización de algunas áreas de la vida eh, y eh, se intentó eh, y se está haciendo hasta el día de hoy con mucho éxito y yo tampoco tengo dudas de que va a ser una eh, tremenda victoria la que vamos a obtener el próximo domingo en Recoleta eh, porque con todo esto, con todo este ataque artero eh, esta investigación tiene casi cuatro años podrían haber formalizado la investigación seis meses después, después de las elecciones las podrían haber eh, formalizado un año antes, no, pero se hace justo seis meses antes de las elecciones para sacarme del cargo violando los derechos civiles y políticos de todos quienes nos escogieron ¿no? y para evitar eh, que pudiéramos terminar este periodo cosechando todos los éxitos que tuvimos eh, y, que, y, y todos los impactos que generamos desde las reformas que hicimos en Recoleta y que escalaron a nivel de políticas eh, nacionales eh, yo me quisiera quedar ahí solo reiterar a todas y todos ustedes el agradecimiento por esta organización de este seminario eh, porque creo que hoy día es fundamental que los pueblos del mundo se unan porque con el capitalismo global y con el imperialismo en esta etapa ningún pueblo se salva solo si busca en su territorio de manera autónoma y soberana una alternativa al neoliberalismo y por lo tanto, la necesidad de practicar, de profundizar el, in el internacionalismo, de recuperar eh, una visión de soberanía popular que vaya más allá eh, del Estado de Derecho, porque el Estado de Derecho se logra a través de la soberanía popular. Y por lo tanto, cuando el Estado de Derecho traiciona las confianzas y traiciona las expectativas ¿no? del de, eh, soberano, el soberano tiene todo el derecho a, a sobrepasar, como dice Vladimir Zaflate, Zafatle, eh, el Estado de Derecho que él mismo determina eh, porque es el soberano. Eh, y por lo tanto, eh, el Estado de Derecho no puede ser el límite para el soberano. Puede ser el límite para la acción de quienes se desarrollan en la política, pero no y nunca para el soberano. Así que darles y reiterarles el agradecimiento eh, por este seminario y desearles todo el éxito en el tiempo que viene espero que estemos eh, reuniéndonos de nuevo para poder celebrar con éxito los resultados de la próxima semana muchas gracias a todos y a todas Muchísimas gracias Daniel um, I, I think that he definitely has given us a lot of things to consider in our discussion. Uh, I think those of us who live in the United States are always faced with, we are at the center of an empire and what does it mean to be in true solidarity? And also what does it mean to be in solidarity today which a lot of those kind of networks that were so prominent and good in the 1960s and 70s have been lost and destroyed. And I think it's, um, it's the reason why many of us are here to uh, reestablish those kind of solidarity networks and also with a specific kind of line of politics. And it's true in terms of the impact of right-wing politics uh, that is happening across our continent. Next, um, uh, and uh, where is uh, David Legg. And after that, we will have our music presentation and then uh, discussion, questions and discussions. All right, thank you. Next is David.
Okay, Solidarity started screen sharing. Mason, are you able to share my screen, my, my slides? Yeah, you should be able to share. I can't. Are you sharing? I thought you were going to project the slides. I'm attempting to. It's not popping up. Are you able to see that? Yeah, I can do it. Okay. Uh, Nathan, we we can't see your screen. It just says yeah. that you started screen sharing, but we can't see it. Yeah, um, I'm not sure like... why. Okay, let me see if I uh let me see if I can do it. Yvonne, I can present. Okay, why don't you do it, David? That would be perfect. Okay. Um, Comrade Daniel, we're celebrating you. We celebrate Comrade Daniel. For creating the People's Pharmacy Movement. For organising all of the other municipal initiatives, libraries, bookstores, universities, etc. For engaging in health policy debate, including the uh, retail drug price transparency initiatives. For engaging in political debate more generally, including Palestine, Palestine solidarity, for linking municipal action to geopolitical change, and most of all, for frightening the national bourgeoisie so much that they had to conjure up a corruption scare and lock you up. Okay, celebration. I'm coming from the, I'm joining you here from Melbourne in Australia, and I'm speaking from Wurundjeri land, land which has never been ceded to the colonists. Um, and I appreciate the, the emphasis on uh, recognising settler colonialism in the organisation of this seminar. The People's Health Movement is a global network of health activists working for global health equity equity in terms of the highest attainable standard of health, which is the WHO constitution, equity in affordable access to decent health care, including access to medicines. But global health equity is not going to be achieved under the present regime of transnational capitalism and US imperialism. The challenge that we see as PHM, the People's Health Movement, is how to implement local and immediate actions in ways that also impact this wider regime. And this is why we are inspired by the work of Comrade Daniel. The popular pharmacies have promoted access to treatment by selling pharmaceuticals at wholesale cost, by procuring cheaper pharmaceuticals internationally, by forcing the private pharmacy chains to moderate their prices. And this has led to cost of living relief and reduced the rate of healthcare impoverishment. But there's a lot more to be done. We need to look at the quality of medicines, the efficient use of medicines. We need to look at equitable and efficient healthcare financing. We need to look at the wholesale cost of medicines, which means confronting big pharma. We need to look at the economic structures. 
which create continuing dependency, economic, create deepening economic inequality and poverty. And we need to overcome imperialism, which reproduces those economic structures. I want to tell two stories from the COVID pandemic, which highlight the role of transnational capitalism, but particularly imperialism, in maintaining um, huge barriers to access to medicines, access to treatment. The first of all was the refusal of Big Pharma to participate in what was called the COVID technology access pool, which Dr. Tedros of WHO tried to set up in the first couple of months of the pandemic. This would have encouraged voluntary licensing of effective pharmaceuticals and vaccines, but Big Pharma would have nothing to do with it, supported by the US. The second story is the story about the TRIPS waiver that um, late in 2020, India and South Africa proposed a waiver of certain provisions of the TRIPS agreement so that local production could be encouraged. And again, Big Pharma, supported by the US and its allies, refused to agree to this waiver. I think it's important to ask why this disregard of peoples who are denied access. And I think it reflects the continuing arrogance of coloniality. And the arrogance of coloniality is not going to be changed by nice words. It can only be changed by resistance. It's important to recognise that behind Big Pharma is Big Finance. Big Pharma is owned by the banks, the insurance companies, the hedge funds, the pension funds and the private wealth funds. The wealth of the ultra rich in the US, in Chile, in Australia, comes largely from rent, including from Big Pharma, rent which is mediated by big finance. And the profits from pharma and the capital gains from buying and selling pharma are propped up by the monopoly powers based on extreme intellectual property rights. These monopoly powers are imposed through an imperial power and comprise a very significant component of this flow of wealth. Big Pharma is a creature of transnational capitalism and imperialism. And to understand how this operates, it is necessary to recognise, first of all, two key dynamics of transnational capitalism. One is the global crisis of overproduction, and the other is the financialization of advanced capitalist economies. And it's necessary to recognise two defining features of imperialism. One is unequal power relations, through which are imposed unequal exchange relations. This is the definition of imperialism. In the next couple of slides, I've made some pictures about overproduction and financialization, but I don't have time to go through these now. I hope you'll be able to access the handout and look at them later. I've made some pictures about unequal power relations of imperialism, but I don't have time now. I hope you'll be able to look at these later. And importantly, I've got a picture of unequal exchange and how that is mediated. And I hope you'll be able to look at that later. This, this horrible picture simply talks about the way in which financialization and the crisis of overproduction are managed by neoliberal discipline, in particular through the WTO and imperial sanctions, and the disciplines of finance down the bottom right-hand corner. Again, I don't have time to go through this. The People's Health Movement discussed all these issues at our fifth People's Health Assembly in Mar del Plata in Argentina in April 2024. And 
I reference you to our background paper and our call to action, which carries some of these ideas further. Here's some nice pictures of our People's Health Assembly in Mar del Plata. PHM's strategic method at Mar del Plata was first of all the sharing of stories, then looking at the economic and geopolitical background, then looking at possible futures, and then clarifying strategic directions and committing to action. And I want to talk about our public pharma project, which is an action initiative which was agreed upon at the at Mar del Plata in April this year. If you think about the future, you can start with business as usual. But business as usual offers us continuing inequity, inequity regarding access to healthcare technologies. It also offers us xenophobia, alienation, echo chambers and fascism. There are alternatives and I don't really have time to go through this slide, but I want to make the point that there are the alternatives, opportunities for different pathways will come up, but whether they are taken will depend upon struggle. And the, in terms of what might support that struggle, I've got on this slide five ideas five, which are inspiring, which might encourage people to join that struggle. Gwen Vivere, in terms of the, 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 the philosophy of living well and decoloniality, which we've talked about, which some of our colleagues call epistemic liberation. Optimism of the will, taken from Gramsci, against pessimism of the intellect. Eco-socialism, by which I mean democratically accountable, ecologically sustainable economic planning and the possibility of new geopolitical configurations. And in this context, I'm thinking specifically of the call from the group of 77 and China for a new, new international economic order, which we are keen to work around. In terms of a theory of change, We've identified these six. Sorry, someone can help me with that. No. In terms of a theory of change, there are, we've got these six principles. The first of is, is this micro macro principle that can we find ways of addressing the local and immediate challenges that we're facing in ways that also contribute to redressing those longer term challenges. Secondly, is a point raised by, by Comrade Daniel, the need for direct cultural action, living differently, commoning, living well, reaching across difference, building solidarity, building a culture of hope. That doesn't mean that there's no role for political advocacy, and there is, for po policy action and accountability. From a health point of view, working through, working with community and through primary health care is quite a central uh, strategy. And finally, working towards a convergence of social and political movements by seeing the commonality of structural oppression and building solidarity across difference and across boundaries. Our public pharma campaign is based on those principles. The public pharma campaign is linked to strengthening health systems. It's embedded in the struggle for comprehensive primary health care. It will provide a platform for building solidarity across difference and a convergence of movements. It is a step towards democratically accountable economic planning or eco-socialism. It will be linked to the emergence of new geopolitical configurations. And it will generate inspiration, like the work in Recoleta, for the broader struggle, solidarity, buen vivir, against individualism and materialism and for optimism of the will. So we celebrate you, Comrade Daniel. 
where celebrate we're inspired by your practice creating change with immediate and local benefit embedding the people's pharmacy initiative in a broader program of municipal initiatives and engaging in national policy debate to achieve systemic change. We also celebrate the international solidarity shown by the Hardware Libre campaign, and we salute the sponsoring organisations of the Teach-In. And thank you for inviting PHM to be part of this important event. Thank you, Did David. I stay within my time? Hey, thank you, David. Um, so I think next we will have our musical guest. Is that correct? Boy? Sí. Hola, buenas noches. Muchas gracias. Estoy muy contenta por la invitación. Estoy muy agradecida de la invitación. Me parece muy interesante las palabras de todo. Me parece muy necesario escuchar a Daniel. Me, me llena de esperanza, la verdad. Uh, y quisiera compartir mi canto con ustedes en esta ocasión tan especial y tan necesaria en que convergen nuestras aguas por esta conversación, insisto, muy necesaria. Voy a partir presentándome en mi lengua natal. Soy una mujer, una cantora mapuche. Mary Mary Compuche, Mary Mary Pulamien, Inche Carmen Lianqueo, from Valparaíso. Esta canción es un, tribujo, un tributo a mi linaje femenino. Se llama Carahue la tierra de mis ancestras. Tu 
gozo de sepulto. Galera, un público aquí <ríe> escuchándome, está mi familia, están mis amigos y mi equipo técnico al que le mando eso. Muchos saludos también porque um, hicieron posible esta transmisión. Estoy muy emocionada, súper emocionada, la verdad. Eh, ver a Daniel ahí hablando <ríe> me dio así como un Nehuen increíble. Nehuen le llamamos nosotros los mapuches a ese sentimiento de poder que que nos hace conectarnos con lo más sagrado y lo más divino que somos nosotros mismos, nuestro propio espíritu. La canción que acaban de escuchar se llama Caragüe y es, como les decía, un tributo a mi linaje femenino. Mi madre, mi abuela, vienen de un lugar muy hermoso que se llama Hualmapu, que queda en el sur de Chile, y la verdad es que desde ahí proviene todo mi imaginario musical, eh, y siento que tiene mucho que ver con la conversación del día de hoy. La siguiente canción que voy a cantar eh, se llama Solita. Alone. <ríe> eh, porque en el fondo vivimos todo este mundo solos, pero no tanto.
estar sola es una idea o tal vez una lección yo tengo mi voz mis manos estoy con mi corazón al final no estaba sola yo siempre conmigo voy y la vida es más sabrosa cuando me acompaña tú cantando me voy solita solita me voy Así solita de seguir Será que este es mi destino Porque solita de seguir Será que este es mi destino ah, 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 ah. Mira no pasa nada Mira no pasa nada Fuerte Fafán. Bueno, eh, lo que acaban de escuchar de aquí de mi familia, mestizos mapuches con chilenos, <ríe> es una Fafán. Nosotros los mapuches no aplaudimos. We don't clap our hands. Nosotros gritamos. Ya, 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 ya. Con esta. Ya, 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 ya. Ya, vos familia, ustedes. ¡Ya, ya, ya, ya! Bueno, ese es un fuerte afafán para Daniel. No puedo no, no, no sentirme involucrada con, con un sentimiento humano que tiene que ver con transmitir alegría, esperanza y solidaridad también, por supuesto. Creo que la música, eso es lo bonito que tiene que... Eh, traspasa fronteras, traspasa lenguajes, traspasa idiomas. Y, y mi sentimiento en este momento es, aparte de cantarles mi música, es eh, de alguna forma eh, empaparnos con este mensaje que tiene que ver con un pensamiento para nosotros, quiero decir que, no, que, que podría ser elevado, pero siento que tiene un sentir de humanidad solo un sentir de humanidad y por eso traje mi canto el día de hoy eh, hoy 19 de octubre celebramos acá en Valparaíso eh, el aniversario del estallido social acá hace un par de años atrás hubo un estallido social en donde todos salimos a la calle con la esperanza de que las cosas podían cambiar podían ser distintas eh, en el fondo de mi corazón sigo creyendo que un mundo mejor es posible y siento que gracias a estas conversaciones eh, puedo sentirlo más cerca. Esta canción se llama Tinku, con esta canción me voy a despedir. Y Tinku es una palabra, un vocablo aymara de nuestros hermanos del norte eh, que compartimos también eh, con, con Bolivia, con Perú, con Argentina. Eh, tinku es un ritmo andino y es muy poderoso, te hace sentir con mucha energía y a mí me gusta cantarlo para despedirme, para que la gente se lleve este ritmo. Y este Tinku, eh, con un fuerte afafán, <ríe> se lo quiero dedicar a Daniel también. Y muchas gracias por la invitación nuevamente. Estoy muy emocionada y agradecida por la conversación y por porque existe la posibilidad de que nos sentemos a conversar sobre nuevas formas de pensar, nuevas formas de sentir, nuevas formas de relacionarnos, nuevas formas de, de, de vivir, de soñar con un mejor vivir. Así que eso, muchas gracias, me despido con Tinku. Y voy a pedirle a mi público que me haga palmas. <ríe> Pueden hacer ustedes también público allá, palmitas. <ríe> ¡Eso! Cero. Oh. 
dirección hacia lo profundo. Eso, para poder vivir en el mundo. Voy con la mente en estado carretera, yo ya cogí mi rumbo. Mañana cuando yo me vaya, no me llames por mí, hombre que ya me fui. Estos pensamientos del corazón me ayudan a sentir. Lucero de la mañana, otra vez te vi salir. Yeah, 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 yeah. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Carmen. Qué precioso. Ay, oh, gracias y... a ti. No, para nada. <risa> <risa> um, Sale un corazoncito. <risa> sí. Um, Oye, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Estoy de verdad muy emocionada. Estaba así como... Oh. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Muchas gracias por el compartir. Para mí, de verdad, es muy importante estarlos escuchando ustedes acá en este momento desde Chile. Es demasiado importante. Así que muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Carmen. And now we're going to transition to our uh, questions and answer period uh, after that kind of beautiful musical uh, presentation. And um, so I don't know if Yvonne is around. Um, Sorry, Romina, we have yeah. direct responses. Oh, OK. We well, have a round of direct responses. Sorry. You want to do that? I don't know where. I, I think we should do, sorry, I think we should do some direct responses. So um, if folks have some additional ideas um, that they want to share, including Rodrigo, uh, David, and yourself, maybe we could do a round of hearing any direct responses. Okay, I will open up to Rodrigo and David. Um, Rodrigo? Estás uh, en micrófono. Rodrigo, you're muted. Rodrigo, tu micrófono no está funcionando. Perdón. Eh, decía que agradezco la oportunidad de haberme encontrado con ustedes. Fue personalmente muy emocionante ver a mi compañero Daniel. Eh, por cuestiones del proceso estamos impedidos de comunicarnos todos aquellos que trabajamos en la municipalidad con, con Daniel Jadwe. Eh, eh, me parece extraordinariamente necesario que se realicen este tipo de encuentros que ponen de relieve distintas experiencias que sin embargo convergen en algunos objetivos compartidos que son de la máxima importancia como la búsqueda eh, de alternativas que desmercantilicen la vida de las personas y en ese afán naturalmente estos encuentros adquieren todo el sentido para intercambiar puntos de vista, para conocernos y potenciar nuestras luchas. Así que solo eh, agradecer la invitación y la solidaridad eh, con Recoleta y con Daniel Jadwe. David. Ya. Yeah. Um, I'd su support what the Rodrigo has said. Uh, I think it's a wonderful initiative. Um, perhaps I could just say a little bit more about the People's Health Movement, because one of 
the programs of the People's Health Movement is our International People's Health University and maybe the, uh, the Free University of Recoleta might be able to build some links with our uh, the International People's Health University. At the moment, we are running a number of um, short courses um, through the our what we call the IPHU, and uh, it would be terrific to build close, closer links with the Solidarity Research Centre and with the Free University of Recoleta. David, permíteme agradecer tu generoso ofrecimiento y pierde cuidado que te lo vamos a cobrar porque es muy necesario que busquemos esas formas de cooperación. La UAR tiene alguna experiencia también en, en ofrecer programas en bilingües, por ejemplo, en, y en formatos digitales que aseguran una amplia cobertura. Así que vamos a conversar en los próximos días. Muchas gracias, David, por tu generoso ofrecimiento. Romina, I'm keen to hear if, what are the questions in the box. Uh, I don't know where to find that, so I'm not sure. Are there questions in the box? We don't have any questions yet. No. Ah. All right, so should we, at this point, should we ask people to go ahead and write questions if they have any? I'm sorry. Even though I use Zoom as a professor, I almost never know how to use it. I get lost all the time. So I really don't. I'm terrible at technological stuff. <laughs> um, all right. So there is a Q&A button uh, for people to use. And um, Romina, we do we do have a question here in Los Angeles. Okay. Phillips, can you come up here to the microphone, please? Buenos a todos. Can I ask a little bit about, can you expand, please, on the ideas of what you have planned for more educational programs for your community? And how do you both do outreach to have more community support? All right, so then there's a couple more questions also on uh, that have been sent in. Uh, one specifically about how, what actions can we take as individuals who want to help advocate for the Hathaway's release? Um, and uh, I don't know if the panelists can also see some of these, these questions that are here. Yeah. Okay, so there's one specifically for the PHM also. Uh, I wonder if PHM uh, does any advocacy for healthcare in prisons. And also another question, is there a network or some kind of list of current political prisoners for both Chilean and Mapuche? I can tell you the last one, the answer is yes. <laughs> we have many political prisoners, uh, but, uh, um, but there's also other ones as well. So I, let's see. Okay. So, Rodrigo, uh, la, la pregunta que, ¿escuchaste la pregunta que hicieron en Los Ángeles? No la escuché completamente claro. ¿Me la puedes repetir, por favor? Um, let's see. Oh, the audio wasn't great. Uh, Yvonne, we, do you we, can, we can repeat it, repeat it again. Uh, okay. Philip is here to repeat his question. 
Yes, this is from Los Angeles. I was asking about the further plans for education and what are the ideas that uh, are being developed, if that, that, if that could be explained further. And another question was, how do you reach out to your communities for support? That was something like it. Perfecto. Eh, en el caso de la Universidad Abierta Recoleta, nosotros tenemos seis años de existencia, hemos tejido una amplia red de colaboraciones a nivel nacional e internacional y tenemos la impresión que hay una mirada convergente y es ejemplo de ello posiblemente es el ofrecimiento que acaba de hacer David de muchas instituciones que despliegan actividades formativas en términos de converger y empezar a estructurar propuestas formativas más robustas, eh, articuladas a veces en currículum incluso, para perfiles de luchadores en distintos ámbitos, particularmente aquellos que son eh, fundamentales eh, para las luchas sociales. Y, eh, y por lo tanto vamos a ir en busca de esas articulaciones con distintas organizaciones en el mundo para ofrecer mejores oportunidades formativas a todos aquellos que están en procesos de lucha y transformación. David, uh, did you hear, uh, do you want me to repeat the PHM question? No, um, I, I've got it clearly. Thanks, Romina. Um, PHM, I don't think, has a major program in relation to healthcare in prisons, except that the, uh, the Palestine solidarity work that has been done through PHM is very much focused, uh, includes a focus on uh, the, uh, the, the problems of, yeah, the challenges of imprisonment on, in the West Bank and so forth, uh, although the, the genocide is, um, puts, is, is overshadowing that at this time. But taking the broader question about networks and working through community, um, one of the things about the people's health movement is, is that we, our work is based in part on the principle of primary health care, which is that local health services should be working with their communities to both ensure decent access to decent health care, but also to act upon the factors which shape the health of communities. And so one of our principal um, platforms for working with community is finding um, health practitioners who are progressive health practitioners and building uh, building into their practice, finding ways of building into their practice um, advocacy and uh, activities of change. And in this respect, the ideas of the popular pharmacy movement uh, illustrate this perfectly is about using in this case using work to promote access to medicines to also promote an understanding of the broader situation which shapes inequitable access thank you david there is another question from uh here it says that um from YSA uh, or ISA, uh, and uh, and they mentioned they ask. I'm going to translate it from Spanish. Uh, how can we close the gap of solidarity between the U.S. and the world? Uh, what can we do here, considering our material conditions and the political situations in both countries? Uh, I would just like to begin to answer this question because it's something I think about a lot and mainly because my entire life has been between Chile and the United States, uh, that I'm always thinking about how to close that gap. And one of the things I always I always um, begin with is 
the political position where we stand. For example, whenever there's protests in Venezuela or Cuba, meaning, you know, like let's say those who are critical of the regimes, uh, I'm always surprised about the amount of leftists who focus on supporting those protests rather than uh, pointing to the, the many policies that the United States has led in deteriorating the conditions of life in those countries, especially the blockade in Cuba and Venezuela. And in a recent report, for example, from the New York Times stated clearly that the, the impact of US sanctions on Venezuela has created conditions of depression that are three or four times bigger than the global depression of the 1930s. And if you think about that, how it has absolutely devastated the country to the ground. And I always think about the position that I am as somebody who is living in the United States, my focus is always gonna be first, what the US is doing in terms of ruining and damaging the, the lives of uh, the material lives of people in other countries. And um, and when it comes to political, uh, the creations of better solidarity networks, the best solidarity networks that have, have existed, at least through my knowledge, especially between the US and Latin America, is specific moments and specific campaigns. The anti-fascist network in the 1930s was incredibly powerful. Uh, and also in the 60s and 70s, especially in solidarity with the Cuban Revolution and the many movements, including in Chile, when we had a socialist president Allende before he was overthrown by a CIA-backed coup. And those networks were based on, on real uh, tangible questions that were about supporting political work that was done. And I think we've, it's been very difficult in the last 20, 30 years for us to create better solidarity networks because most of what we do is send uh, letters of solidarity, but we don't actually do political work that is about expanding the same political demands and needs that we're trying to accomplish across the board. Um, so that is sort of my take on, on that question. I don't know if either Rodrigo or David wanna add anything to that question. No. All right. No. All right. So there is a couple of uh, other questions. Oh, sorry. Isa Isabella. Muchas gracias por la pregunta. Uh, there is a question about Universidad Abierta. Um, Rodrigo, hay otra pregunta para, para ti. Um, uh, I'll say it in English so it can be translated. Uh, uh, um, so it's not too back, back and forth in translation. It says, for those of us uh, not fluent in Spanish, what are some good resources to finding out more about Universidad Abierta Recoleta and various other municipal municipalist uh, initiatives set up in Recoleta over the years? Gracias por la pregunta. La Universidad Abierta Recoleta en su sitio web eh, reúne toda la información acerca de lo que hemos hecho en nuestros primeros seis años de existencia. La dirección es www.uar.cl. Ahí están las memorias anuales de estos seis años. Están muchas investigaciones sobre el resto de las iniciativas populares eh, impulsadas desde Recoleta, como la farmacia popular, la óptica, la inmobiliaria, los programas de salud. Próximamente vamos a publicar eh, una investigación sobre el Centro de Rehabilitación Popular de Recoleta, que está abierto a toda clase de personas, desde neurodivergentes o personas en situación de discapacidad. Eh, así que el sitio web de la universidad es el mejor lugar para informarse acerca de lo que hacemos. Fantastic. And also, David added the website uh, to the chat, if anybody wants to go there directly. And, and if you have difficult, for example, if you don't know Spanish, uh, um, <laughs> I have to say, as someone who has to sometimes work with documents that I don't speak, for example, I'm a historian, I sometimes have to work with German language documents from the uh, Chilean German community. Uh, I use uh, various Google resources and the translations are much, much better now. So it's not going to be perfect, 
but at least it could be a start in terms until you learn Spanish, right? Uh, that in terms of using that on the website. Oh, Romina, we have a question here in person from Los Angeles. You want to hold it up to the mic? Maybe not hold it up to your face. <laughs> that may not be us. Can you hear me all right? Um, can you hear me all right? Oh, okay. I see you're nodding. Okay, awesome. Um, so this is for Rodrigo. You were talking earlier about um, the University of Recoleta, and I I wanted. I, I missed when you were elaborating on the neoliberalism and how, you know, Recoleta, there are policies that are, are responding to, you know, uh, could you please elaborate more on that and how, how like specifically neoliberalism, and neoliberalism is causing problems that Recoleta is responding to? Thank you. No, Joan, nosotros agradecemos la pregunta. Eh, a ver, el neoliberalismo puede ser definido, conceptualizado de muchas formas, pero una que es bastante comprensible para las personas es este ataque que inicia el capitalismo en los años 80 y donde Chile fue el primer lugar donde se aplican sus eh, visiones de la economía en ámbitos donde el capitalismo en general no había actuado anteriormente. Eh, me refiero al ámbito de la salud, el ámbito de la educación, el ámbito de la previsión social, etc. Entonces, esa mercantilización de la vida que, ante, que antes el propio capitalismo no había eh, intentado transformar en un campo de negocio, eh, ha generado un, un conjunto de fenómenos eh, que aún ha aumentado eh, la alienación de las personas. La vida se vuelve más miserable, eh, condicionada por eh, la necesidad de resolver en el mercado cuestiones que son fundamentales para la vida. Entonces, quizás el denominador común de todo lo que se ha hecho en Recoleta es procurar eh, generar acceso a esas mismas cuestiones de una manera más humana, más barata, eh, más eficiente, en un espíritu más colectivo. Y ahora lo que pretendemos hacer es articular todas esas iniciativas en un modelo que eh, profundice esa capacidad de respuesta, sumarle la autoorganización de los vecinos y vecinas e ir construyendo una eh, convivencia una forma de resolver cuestiones fundamentales para la vida eh, por fuera del mercado en resistencia a las lógicas neoliberales. Muchísimas gracias. Um, are there any questions in New York City or uh, in LA? Okay, so I think we should, uh, I think that's it for questions. So we're going to move forward with closing remarks. Uh, any closing remarks from uh, the speakers and such? So either Rodrigo, David, before before we sign off, anything last minute, last thing you want to say? Yeah, yeah, I, I'd like to say that uh, this very meeting is a really important demonstration of building bridges, building links, building solidarity, convergence across movements, and uh, congratulations to the organisers. And can we can we do it again fairly soon, please? Totalmente de acuerdo con las palabras de David. Quizás eh, a nuestro juicio el problema político más interesante del presente es esta puja geopolítica para eh, superar eh, esta fase imperialista, eh, este mundo unipolar en favor de una nueva forma de relacionarse entre los países en un orden multilateral, eh, multinacional. Del mismo modo, eh, las organizaciones, los colectivos 
tenemos que procurar eh, encontrarnos, abrir estos espacios eh, de conocimiento, de intercambio, que permitan aumentar nuestra incidencia en los espacios de lucha que nos toca ocupar a cada uno de nosotros. Solo eh, reiterar nuestra gratitud desde la Universidad Abierta Recoleta y desde la Comuna de Recoleta que nos acoge eh, como un territorio que está en resistencia, que está en lucha y nuevamente agradecerles la oportunidad de dar a conocer nuestro trabajo y de solidarizar con nuestro compañero Daniel Jadwe. Muchísimas gracias. Um, I also want to uh, thank all the speakers uh, for being here. It was extremely helpful in terms of being able to paint in the kind of work that is being done uh, that Daniel has been part of and also related to his, his own uh, campaign for his freedom. I also want to thank our fantastic uh, interpreters and also translators. Uh, so I've been on the other side in translation, so I know the kind of hard work and I can. And so thank you so much, all you for your incredible work and also the organizers for this uh, from Yvonne, Heather, uh, you guys have done an amazing work in putting this together. Uh, I did very little. I'm just here <laughs> moderating. That's it. Um, so thank you so much. I want to, I don't know if it, I want to pass on in case there's anything else we want to say. Yvonne, do you want to add something to the end and let people know where to find more uh, information? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, thank, oh goodness. Is that, do you see the picture of my cat and my dog? Or do you see my, what do you see right now? <laughs> I see the main screen that says, thank you, gracias. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Okay, so for some reason in LA, we're seeing a picture of my cat and dog, but sorry. <laughs> but you, you can hear just with, follow along with me in LA. So I just want to, yeah, thank you again for, for everyone for joining. And um, just want to uh, say that we will have a recording available on our website, solidarityresearch.org. Um, we will have that shortly along with David's slides. So he had a wealth of information on them. Um, we also have a survey, so, you know, your feedback to us is a gift, so we can offer these things in the future, and so that we can be better at it, too. So, um, we have a survey called solidarityresearch.org slash survey. Um, in fact, all of our Zoom friends will be directed to it as soon as they log off, so please help to fill that out. Um, our next panel is going to be November 15th. We have an introduction to the Parent Organization Solidarity Research Center, which is uh, offering this panel. Um, so we you know, welcome you all to join us and you can learn about our different projects, including the Municipalism Learning Series um, and our local work here, Los Angeles for All. Um, and then last, you know, please subscribe to our mailing list and support us. You know, all of this does take some, some resources and some work. So if you have the resources, we ask that you please help to support us and to sustain us. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, and with that, um, I think we will close it out. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.